All right. Thank you so much for being on this podcast, Randy. I'm excited because I don't think I've ever introduced anyone in pharma or at least like that you've previously been in pharma. So it's going to be really interesting to see how your experience kind of lends itself. We mostly had mostly in tech or consulting, but not so much in pharma. So I'm kind of curious about that. So in your words, when would, when should someone reach out to a coach versus finding a mentor? I feel like they're very different, but at the same time, they do overlap a lot. Yeah, it's such a great thought. The way I think about it, first of all, it's not one or the other. You can benefit from both in different ways. And the way I think about it, Christine, is those of us that are lucky have what I consider a board of directors, right? So you have this this board that has different people in different functions there. If you're lucky, it has a mentor. If you're lucky, it has a great boss. It may have a spouse or partner and and a coach and everybody and, and other functions. They all serve a different purpose. And so I've been a mentor to a lot of people. Like when I was still in my corporate career, a lot of people, especially women in the organization would seek me out. There still weren't as many women as there should have been in leadership. The company did much better after. Um, I was just sort of in the start of it. Um, but a lot of women would seek me out for mentoring and I would be as unbiased as I could be in providing them with guidance and advice and things like that. And I was very upfront with them that I wasn't entirely unbiased because if I was impressed with them, I might be looking for an opportunity in my own organization for them. So while I think it would work out in their best interest as well, I wasn't completely unbiased. I had an agenda as a mentor, as a coach, you have no agenda. Like if I work with clients all the time who may have two different opportunities they could pursue, or they're in a job that works for them and something else may, another opportunity may come up. I have no vested interest as their coach, which decision they make. My focus is helping them make the decision that's best for them. And so that's kind of a way that um, a coach and mentor can differ. Um, so you mentioned this a little bit as well on like your leadership as a woman. And this is something that I was very curious because I don't think pharma is a female dominated area, but also, and especially not in leadership. So how did you get there? I did see on your LinkedIn, you jump from company to company. So that kind of answered that question of, is it better? <laughs> uh, maybe in your own words, like you can explain it, but like, what is it sure. better to jump from company to company to be able to get to those goals? Or is it better to stay within one company? I feel like nowadays, most people realize like you do have to kind of jump from company to company. Yeah. It, I don't think there's any one answer, but I would say if in general, people do change companies a little bit, it's not like, you know, you can see people that have a long career and they stay places two years and you kind of wonder why you could understand why somebody might not be the right fit at one company, at two companies. When you get up to four companies, hmm, everywhere you go, you're taking yourself with you. Maybe we need to look internally a little bit. But very often, like for me personally, the way I managed my career, I started with the company I started with. I was a sales rep. I got quickly promoted into sales training in the headquarters and got into marketing from there. But there was an element of, some people thought oh, thought of me as the kid from California carrying a sales bag. So there was a part of me that wanted to go somewhere else to be seen differently. And I was also aware that um, it would be helpful for me to see how things were done somewhere else, to learn best practices from different places and that kind of thing. So I made the decision to leave. I went to to my second company that I really loved, but you know, four years into that, they got bought out by someone else. And I did have an opportunity to stay with that company. They offered me a position, but for a number of reasons, it wasn't right. One of which was the culture of the company didn't feel right. Um, and, you know, then they were offering me a lot of money in a severance package to go away. And because the industry was in growth mode and I was able to find another really good position, it, it was kind of a no brainer to do that. Um, so that took me to my third company, which was the one at which I really grew and flourished and had the biggest jobs. Um, so it served me really well to work for several different companies, but it was very, there were very strategic moves each time. I didn't go into my career thinking I need to work for, for different companies and here's why. I always had an eye towards what I wanted to be doing, the dynamics of the work, this, the environment that I wanted to be in. 
um, how committed did I feel to the mission of the company? Um, those kinds of things. And when those things no longer fit, it was time to make a move. And for me, three big companies was right. And then I went on, on my own. I actually started my own consulting company as a way to, I mentioned boredom was bad for me as a way to keep myself engaged and out of trouble while I was looking for the next team I wanted to join. And then I was a um, chief commercial officer at a small startup for a while. Um, and when that opportunity went away, the company actually ended up selling. We got some negative clinical data, which a small company can't um, survive. That's when I went and opened, um, you know, did my training, got my certification and opened my coaching business. Um, and I don't see that stopping anytime soon. I'm just loving it. That's great. Uh, and for all of the young early career uh, females that we have out there that are listening, what recommendations or advice do you have in terms of growing in your career or advancing in your career? Um, I would say to understand that there isn't any one path, there isn't any one answer. And the company, depending on the company you're with, they may have a defined career path. They may have very specific ideas of where they want to see you growing and where they want to see you go. But you have to be the expert in what's right for you. And you know, if you think about taking a job for two years, say, as a way to get certain experience to let you do something else, that's great. That's not wrong. But don't lose sight of the fact that that's two years of your life that you may be dedicating to something that just isn't right for you. So feel confident to take the advice of people that hopefully have your best interest in mind, but make your own decision based on what feels right for you. Speaking of those questions, what are questions or even frameworks that you would consider to be able to say, like, maybe this is no longer fit for me. Maybe I should move on. I, I would say stay close to how you feel. Like, are you excited about going to work every day? Are you excited about the meetings that you have to attend? Do you feel energized and engaged with the team that you work with? If those things are right, great, you know, learn everything you can get everything you can, assuming that the financials are in place and, and, you know, the F you feel ethically aligned to the company and that kind of thing, then, then that place is great for you. If those things aren't in place, it may be time to think about doing something different. So you really have to stay close to how you feel, how you react to things, um, and, those things change at different phases of your life. So for example, one of the things that I do often with clients, usually early on in an engagement is we'll do a values assessment. And a lot of people do them in different ways. I didn't expect to start there. When I first went out as an executive client, I didn't expect to start there. But it really is an important foundation for people to take a look at what's important to them at this phase of their life and how well are they prioritizing it. And where there are gaps, you often, it will make itself known to you in some way in your life. It will create pain or discomfort or whatever. And the important thing about that is to keep in touch with how those things may change during the course of your life. Like for me, when I was just starting out or when I had, you know, uh, I have one daughter when she was young and at home, my priorities were different than they are now that I'm onto my second career running my own business. So much more in command of my own destiny, if you will, and in the empty nest phase. So the things that, you know, your core values don't change so much, but the things that are your priorities and the, the focus that you want to, the way you want to dial up uh, certain things and whatever does change over different phases of your life. So it's important to stay close to that at every phase and do kind of the inner work that sometimes we don't pay as much attention to. Um, doing that work and finding out what you need to really energize you and put you in your at your best so that you can give your best. Um, it's important to pay attention, attention to that stuff. And we deserve to pay attention to that stuff. So it's almost like giving yourself permission to make yourself a priority in that way. That's very interesting because literally right before this call, I was talking to someone about how they, uh, they were like, I really don't like my work right now. And they were, uh, but like the, 
I always have a different approach with approaching this because there's two types of work. I think one is like very task-based and one's more project-based. He's in a project-based work. So it's a little bit hard for him to tell, is it just this project or is it just this company or my experience at this yeah. company? So yeah, you got to tease like, that out a little bit to get yeah. to the root of it. So when, when would you say is it's just a hardship versus maybe now it's actually time to pull the trigger? Well, I think some of it is you got to look at the practicalities first, because mm -hmm. there are times when you just need a job, you need to pay the rent, you need to yeah. um, pay off student debt, you need, you know, you, whatever that security means to you, like, I know what it means to me based on my upbringing and stuff. But people need to check into the financials first, and see how big a risk can you take. And if you are, you know, feeling that dissatisfied, it may be a great time to look around. But I, before making a jump, I recommend that people really try and figure out what's working for them where they are and what's not, because then you know what problem to solve and you make sure you're not taking the same problem with you. You know, that example of people that may be in a different company every two years, I think that's part of it. I think they may have some blind spots. There may be some things that they're not seeing. And so they're taking the problem with them. So, and I actually offer a free tool that is a good starting place for people. If, if they're kind of thinking, I'm not really sure, I'm not as excited as I used to be about this. I'm not really sure what's going on. A great place to, place to start is a tool that I offer. Um, it's called a career satisfaction assessment. And it just enables people to, on their own, go through and assess eight different pillars of satisfaction, what's working, what isn't, and they could look into then how they may, um, you know, how they may start to fix it. Um, and then on my YouTube channel, I actually offer workshop style where if people, you know, if they want to do it on their own, that's great. And if they want me to walk them through it, it's available there too. So if they go to my website, which is Randy, R-A-N-D-I, robertscoaching.com, and go to the fulfilling career, happy life section, you'll find the tool. And you also find a link to my YouTube channel, and my podcast. Great. And I'm also going to include that link in the show notes and in the oh, description of this video. It's great. It's, it's and it's great. offered for free. No, no, um, you know, no risk, no uh, commitment. It's just, you know, I'm about helping people. Yeah. And if it can help, that's great. That's why it's there. Yeah, I'm definitely going to share that to the person I spoke to before. <laughs> Great. I hope you will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you advocate for yourself? Because I, I feel like a lot of women have issues with advocating for themselves. So I'm kind of curious as someone that has gone through the ranks and now you have your own business, what have you done in your career? Yeah, it's funny. Your listeners are going to think that I, I had the questions in advance, but I promise you, Christine doesn't do that. This is great. Um. So what do I think about for advocating for myself? Because I think it's really important and it's generalization, but I think women are not as good at it as men. And it may be the way we were raised and, and all of the things, but I think we need to, sometimes, you know, it, it may be about getting confident with our story. It may be about giving ourselves permission to stand up, but sometimes you need to, you need to, do some mental tricks almost to give yourself that permission. There are times I had a conversation about this with a client yesterday. I said to her, you're interested in that job, but you're not putting your name in because you didn't meet all the qualifications. Let me ask you a question. What would a man do? And she just started laughing. And she said, he absolutely would put his name in because I don't have to be a hundred percent there. Like a woman would say, I don't meet a hundred percent of those qualifications. I'm not ready yet. Whereas a man would say, I meet 25% of those qualifications. I'm ready. And I'm not saying he's wrong. He believes that he can stretch into the job. Why can't a woman stretch into the job? So don't make the decision for the other person, put your name in and let them decide if you're right or not, just get your foot in the door. So I think sometimes thinking about it, like what would a man do? And I almost feel, it feels wrong to think about it that way. It almost, it feels like anti-feminist somehow or something, but it's not that. It's just don't hold yourself back. Just lean into it. What's the worst thing that could happen? So you don't get it. All right. You weren't going to get it if you didn't try. So try, you know, that kind of a thing. So thinking about it the way a man would um, can sometimes help. Another trick that can sometimes help is 
pretend you're talking about somebody else that you really like, that you really respect, that you would advocate for to the end. And in that way, like I, we somehow will talk in more glowing terms about other people than we will about ourselves. So pretend you're talking about somebody else and advocate for yourself in that way. And it seems silly to need tricks or techniques or whatever, but it's how we build new habits as we practice. So do the thing that you need to do to allow yourself to practice. And then before long, you won't need the tricks. You'll, you will own your own story and confidently step up for yourself. Is that helpful? Yeah, it is. And ironically, when I was at Grace Hopper, there was a session on advocating for yourself. And you literally brought up the two mental tricks they said too. They were like, what would a man do? And then also about if it was your friend and you were giving advice to your friend, what would you do for them? Or what would you, what advice you would give? So literally this is like confirmation. That Actually, it that's, works. it's really cool to hear that because yeah. of how much esteem you have for that organization. I mean, I thought I made this stuff up and the fact that other people are talking about it too is really cool for me to hear. So thank you. Yeah, that conference was really interesting because I have never been surrounded by that much, that many women in tech or women in STEM and being someone of that stature saying something like that is like, okay, I guess like if they've done it, then I can do it too. Yeah. Um, I consider and myself early mid-career, so it's something I don't really hear that much. Yeah, I think it's a great point. You know, one other thing that I would say I think it's important to know is everyone has doubts. Everyone, like I remember when I, I mentioned to you that when I got promoted to the big job and had a new big level of responsibility and was having all these doubts. And I talked to my executive coach about it. And I said, does everybody feel that way? And she said, absolutely. The trick is how well can you cover up for it? How well can you put the support around you, get the experts around you that you need to develop that confidence? But her feeling was, Everybody feels that way. Now, maybe it's biased because people that would seek out a coach might, you know, be feeling that need. But I think it's it's empowering in a way to know that you are not alone in those doubts. And you're, you, you know, in some ways, I think those, I'm calling them doubts, they may be awareness of where you need to grow or whatever you want to call it. For some people, that's really motivating. You know, if you landed in a job that you felt like you you'd mastered day one, I think it could be boring pretty quickly, you know, for people, especially women in tech and STEM. I mean, they're smart, they're driven. They want to learn things and do things. So you need to put yourself in a position where you can stretch. And so that, you know, let the doubts motivate you. All right. Thank you so much for being on this podcast. We definitely learned a lot and all the links will be down below. So hopefully everyone can check out that tool. I know I'm going to be sending that tool to the person I was speaking, speaking to before, but thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me, Christine. I enjoyed our conversation. Of course.